Hi, I'm Ann Partridge, and I'm a breast medical oncologist at Dana, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, where I also lead the adult survivorship program and serve as vice chair of medical oncology and am a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Today, I'm going to be speaking with you about Cancer Survivorship 101. What do you need to know as a cancer survivor or someone who knows a cancer survivor, which is almost all of us, in order to kind of know what to do moving forward? And what do we do at Dana-Farber to try and um, make sure that patients are getting what they need and what hopefully people are doing at the cancer center near you, or at least you can partake in the resources that are available either at a major cancer center if you don't have one near you, or virtually these days, because there is a lot available online uh, to take advantage of. So first of all, let's define who is a cancer survivor. And a cancer survivor has been defined as an individual who is considered a cancer survivor from the time of diagnosis through the balance of his or her life. There are many types of cancer survivors, including those living with cancer and those free of cancer. And people get kind of caught up in the term and a lot of people actually don't like the term. Um, and I respect that, that's okay, but the term is not, you don't have to wear it if you don't feel like it. The term is meant to capture a population of those with a history of cancer, meaning diagnosed at any time, rather than to provide a, a label, and that may or may not resonate with an individual. But um, in general, it's very helpful to think of it as someone who isn't necessarily in the middle of their active therapy, is living with and or beyond cancer. That's what we typically think about it as. And more often dealing with kind of the aftermath of the diagnosis the, and or the treatment. And it's also important to know that survivorship itself, the entity, is not about one point in time. It's about kind of across the cancer trajectory. So once a person's diagnosed with cancer, they're considered a survivor in many settings, and therefore it spans diagnosis and treatment, and then into either completing treatment or on chronic treatment, and then all the way to either end of life or palliative care. People are always a cancer survivor if they've ever been one um, until the end of their life. And so it's important to know that and that there's a lot of overlap with other fields like palliative care and hospice care or other treatment entities or even pre-diagnosis. There's such a thing as pre-vivors, people who are at risk for cancer, which is everybody, but particularly people who are at higher risk, know they have a predisposition to cancer or a high risk, and they're even on that trajectory to some degree. And the really important thing I note on this slide is that um, just like when a person is diagnosed with cancer and we don't throw the same treatments at the same, everybody and we don't do all the same tests for everybody, the needs vary between individuals when it comes to the follow-up care, when it comes to the supportive care. And it also varies within individuals. So what a, what's a person needs when they're first diagnosed or in their early survivorship might be different than what they need in their later survivorship. And that has to do with not only kind of where they might be with regard to the disease, the treatment and the experience of both of them, but it also might have to do with who that patient is, who that person is at the time. And one of the best examples of this is an adolescent or young adult survivor. So, you know, an 18 year old who's diagnosed with cancer may feel very differently, for example, or a 17 year old about their fertility than when they're 28 in their survivorship. And, and they may have been bringing their parents with them when they were first diagnosed. And then they're, you know, in their thirties and mom and dad are no longer there. So there's very, you know, that's a good example of it. And the same is true for people at the other end of the lifespan. You know, older folks have different things to worry about when they're getting on compared to what they might have worried about early on. And you have to think about this in the context of the person, where they are in their lives, as well as potentially other medical and psychosocial issues. So it's a complex area, just like the rest of medical care. Um, it's also important to note that in the United States, at least, and this is true throughout the world, especially in the Western world, as of last year, um, it's estimated that there are at least almost 17 million cancer survivors in the US alone. It, it makes up about 5% of the population. And I actually recently heard a stat that every new diagnosis of cancer in one in four people newly diagnosed with cancer, it's their second cancer. 
So it's not uncommon to have a person who is a cancer survivor get a new cancer because we're having so many cancer survivors diagnosed and living through and beyond cancer, and then they're at risk for a second cancer. Um, it's also important to see the trajectory. And, and, and then the next decade, we expect this number to go up by nearly 30% in terms of the number of cancer survivors. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't want anybody to have cancer, but if you gotta have it, I definitely want people to fall into the survivor group uh, rather than the alternative. Um, and so uh, I think you know we have to deal with this. It's a kind of problem, but with our newer therapies, our better screening, our better treatment, our better supportive care, uh, we are growing this population and i think that's a good thing overall but we need to make sure we care for people and that they can get what they need so that's what this is all about this just shows you who are the cancer survivors out there and if you are a cancer survivor um who you know who might you be uh the largest groups are the diseases that um are screen detected so many people are their diseases are picked up early many people have long-term disease-free survival or a cure uh, that's breast cancer colon cancer prostate cancer and then a lot of other diseases and even in the groups that are evolving melanoma lung we're seeing many many more survivors here um so we're very optimistic and and it's something that's again always a work in progress and these numbers aren't because people don't survive it's because the numbers are actually small um, all right, and this just shows you also, so I showed you the type of cancers people are living through and beyond. Um, but this shows you like what are the ages of people who get cancer and then are living through and beyond. And cancer is generally a disease of aging. Now I myself focus on breast cancer in young women, but that's the minority of patients. More than half of patients diagnosed with breast cancer are in their you know, 60s and beyond. And that's true of even more so of prostate cancer and other the other most common disease. And so you can see that a little over half of cancer survivors are in their 60s or 70s. Fewer in their 80s because they're of course dying of other things, not because they don't you know live through the cancer. Um, and then there's a smattering of the younger ages. But you know we see in the newspaper and hear the stories of the young person getting cancer and living through it, and and that's because that's news. You know, the older person getting cancer, not so much news. It's you know more common, although obviously still important, but it's important to have this perspective. So as people like me design programs to help support people, um, it really is important to think about who's the group of people you're gonna try and support if you're focusing on all cancer survivors. I think the other important thing for folks to know if you're new to this is that, um, you know, we've been trying to fix the problem of optimal cancer survivorship care for the last couple decades. Uh, there was actually a searing report done on our, by our United States Institute of Medicine that looked at the experience of cancer survivors and they called it from cancer patient to cancer survivor lost in transition. And this was a review of care, research, everything that was going on in the environment at that time in the United States and our medical systems. And, and when I was part of this and contributed some work and went to the presentation of it, uh, and it was pretty humbling. And it was, you know, survivorship care is a neglected phase historically of the cancer care trajectory. At that time, there were few guidelines on follow-up care. Providers lacked education and training. There was a lack of coordination regarding primary care specialists and primary care. And what I would say is we've actually come a long way since that time. And all of these things are being addressed in due time. Not perfect, we're not perfect yet, but it's no longer neglected. Places like Dana-Farber and other cancer centers have created survivorship programs. Uh, there's things like this program here for you uh, being created by our friends in, in the community so that all can have access to information and support. There are also guidelines that have been produced by the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, and then many other bodies. Um, and then there's a lot of education and training going on, both for patients and survivors, but also for clinicians. In fact, we run a continuing medical education course uh, that focuses on educating doctors, nurses, physicians assistants, PAs, and um, nurse practitioners about how to care for cancer survivors, and as well as specialists. And then finally, the coordination issue. And this is where, even though we can all lament the medical record and how painful it is, uh, and you feel like your doctor's talking to a computer, 
I think we are getting better and better coordinated because many of us can see inside other people's medical records from other centers and it's much easier to CC someone on a note. So I do think our coordination is getting better with better technology, but it's not perfect yet. And then, you know, the question is why does survivorship care matter? Um, I think it really matters because not just because patients want to know what they need, but it's because we need to be able to detect problems that can be prevented, cured, or controlled for a patient so that they don't get sicker because of a history of cancer or treatment. And then we also, from a both for the patient and the person who's survived cancer and his or her family, as well as our in, environment, meaning um, you know the, the our social environment. We don't want to overuse or underuse medical resources and follow up. And this has been documented to be not uncommon. So it's getting better, but there have been things that have been done over the years just because we could or patients wanted it when there wasn't evidence that it would help people in the long run. And we try now to build the evidence base to not do that and to do things that make sense for patients and that are supported by data as opposed to just doing stuff because we can't. And the good news is that there's been a lot of progress and there's been an increasing focus on research uh, to understand more fully and improve how we care for cancer survivors. Um, you can see here, this is even an old slide because the last time somebody looked at this officially and published on it was in 2011, but you can see the trajectory. And of course it's going up, up and up over the last decade. So that's exciting. Lots more work, lots more funding from our government to support survivorship research. So just taking a step back, I promised I'd say, what do you need to think about personally now that we have all that background? And I think when I think about cancer survivorship, anytime I see a patient, I try and follow up with that patient in these four big buckets. And if I attend to each of these buckets for that patient, you don't have to get to every single thing. You're not gonna know every single thing, but it's more a covering each of the buckets aspect. I can generally get at what that patient needs, how they need to move forward and make sure I'm dotting the I's and crossing the T's about their care. So let me go through it with you. And if you remember one thing from today or you wanna take a screenshot, this is it. So first and foremost, what and what the doctors and the care teams are typically pretty good at is recurrence and new cancers. Everybody's worried, is the cancer gonna come back? Is there a new cancer? Am I at risk again? And you know, here's where it's really the devil is in the details. So, you know, many diseases, we actually do scans looking for recurrence and that's a standard and there's evidence to support doing that. Many diseases like breast cancer, which is where I take care of people, there actually is evidence that doing scans looking for recurrence elsewhere in the body doesn't improve how people do. So we don't recommend it. Um, we do do imaging of remaining breast tissue in that setting. So you kind of have to know your, what disease a person has and then you've got to know the evidence to support what's the right thing to do for that person in follow-up, to look for either recurrence or new primary of the cancer they already had or a new cancer. So you want to think about, okay, I've got a breast cancer survivor. I may not be the one doing her colon cancer screening, but I want to make sure that she's getting back into her primary care physician so that that person's doing screening for everything else that I'm not covering because you don't want them to fall through the cracks. And that happens sometimes. People will say, oh, I you know, bonded with my oncologist. I just want to see her. And I say, no, 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 I don't give vaccines. I don't screen for anything but breast cancer. You don't want that. I don't treat hypertension. I don't want you having a stroke. So we need to plug people back in with the primary, but an important area there is screening for other cancers because that's typically going to be driven by the primary care. The other big thing we think about nowadays, and this is important for anybody who's pretty far out, is especially if you had a cancer that we now know may be driven by a hereditary predisposition, if you have a strong family history or you've had more than one cancer, um, genetics. Genetics has been revolutionized over the last two decades. Many of you have probably heard of the BRCA genes, the BRCA1, BRCA2. Now there are a set of other genes that we can even test for and the barriers to testing has gone down insurances are more likely to pay for it. And the tests have gotten more um, kind of exhaustive. They're longer. There are more things to look at that might inform someone's either care or screening in the future or options for prevention. So that's something to revisit with your oncologist. If you're still seeing your oncologist and follow up and say, hey, anything new on the genetics um, uh, front. And also your primary care. If you're out several years from a breast cancer and say you had a young breast cancer or a young prostate cancer, 
might be worth checking in, especially if you had a strong family history, or if you don't know your family history. So that's the big bucket of recurrence in new cancer. And I can tell you, I see people a lot and I say to them, you know, oh, did we check genetics way back then? Or did they have genetics in 2011? And we started doing more panel testing after 2013. Let me get her back into genetics. And maybe we'll, if she if she's interested. So that's a big group. The second big bucket, and this one's usually pretty evident for a patient and it varies by disease, is the long-term late effects. Long-term late effects are things like, you know, what do you still have that hurts, that bothers you, that the person comes in, tells you about, or you have to ask about, I still don't like my scar. I still have neuropathy from my, um, my platinum. I, you know, still have trouble with my bowels after my colon surgery. That's the long-term late effects. And then there are some more insidious things that we worry about, like hearts that can be affected by, say, chest radiation or um, premature menopause that may affect a person's bone health, things that we may have done that didn't cause a problem right away from the treatment, but that can cause a problem later if we had surgery and removed ovaries at a young age. And so all those things can contribute to either long-term as in started during the treatment and continued and continue to either bother the person or you need to attend to or late affects the risks. And those vary by the disease and they vary by the age that a person got treated as well as the treatment they got. So, so a person who's caring for you wants to kind of have a, have a sense of, okay, what are the long-term effects a person has been suffering from and, and what are they at risk for and the late effects that might pop up on them, even though they don't feel them. Again, in breast cancer, we're typically thinking about things like bone health, premature menopause, um, heart damage sometimes in some settings. And that's true in a lot of diseases, especially if they got chest radiation. And then we often have them see the cardiologist or get an echo and things like that. And there are standard recommendations for this. The other big bucket, oh, before we get on to that, the other long-term late effect that I don't want to neglect, and I'll talk about this later, is the psychosocial health of that patient and that patient's family, okay? Because we know that cancer doesn't just affect the patient, it affects their whole kind of you know, system. And so we try to pay attention to that and I try to attend to that in the care of my patients or plug patients in if they need help because we know sometimes you know, the experience of cancer can be traumatic for many people and it can be the gift that keeps on giving um, in terms of uh, re-traumatizing even when people come in and see me for a mammogram or if they have a new symptom and they're worried. So paying attention to that, making sure people are plugged in from an emotional health standpoint, really important. The third big bucket is modifiable health behaviors. What does that include? Smoking and smoking cessation, weight management, exercise. We know all these things are not only good and good for you and good at preventing other diseases like heart disease, but we don't want you to get a second cancer that could have been prevented because we could have helped you to lose weight and or exercise and or quit smoking and other risk reducing behaviors. So we want to attend to that. We know that patients want to change, sometimes getting uh, support from the doctor to say, do it. We're plugged in with resources like the Live Strong at the Y program or some of the resources we have at Dana-Farber at our Zacom Center or research studies that can do this. There's all kinds of stuff. And these days, again, this is an area where there's a lot of good stuff on the web. And then finally, coordination of care. It's not a sexy bucket, but it's an area where this is what I think about, I don't want you seeing too many people too much, right? I don't want you to be over-medicalized as a cancer survivor. My goal is to keep you out of the cancer center and out of the doctor's office. And so this is where I always like to sit down with a patient when I see them and follow them and say, okay, who are you still seeing in follow-up? You only need to see me X, you know, every six months or every year, my team. Are you, why are you still seeing the surgeon if I'm doing a breast exam? You know, do you really need to still see the radiation oncologist or can you just see one of us? You know, that's an important question. And patients and the doctors need to decide that. We have that worked out at Dana-Farber, how we typically do it. Uh, and we've come up with algorithms for who should be doing what in follow-up. People love their survivors, but the patient, and the patient often wants to see the doctor. So I'm not gonna, I, I don't get um, too rigid about it, but I think sometimes patients look at me and they say, why, why do I need to see you again? If I'm seeing so-and-so, I say, you're right, you don't. So I think figuring that out with a patient can spare them some extra tips to Boston in my case, or you know, more time on the golf course or more time with their kids or their grandkids. Um, so coordination of care, who do I really need to see, who do I don't need to see? And this is the other important place of making sure people are in with the specialist and or their primary care. Because again, once someone gets out of the kind of cancer trenches and it is more in a long-term, not getting active therapy anymore, you really want the primary care to be the 
the quarterback or the point guard again, because hopefully the things that are going to happen to that patient in the long run will be more in their arena than in the cancer or cancer treatment arena. All right. Um, so at Dana Farber, you know, we try and do this. We have the goals of our survivorship program are to align this with sort of goals with the strengths of our institute, like any other cancer center, we want to deliver outstanding, comprehensive, high quality care. Um, and we also try to conduct impactful patient based and clinical research or biomedical research that might inform how we care for patients ultimately. And then we also try to really hard to provide education to both patients, providers, and the public like now. So um, we try and hit all that. As I alluded to, we've created guidelines for follow-up care. So there are evidence-based guidelines and there, then there's the, what does the prudent oncologist do? And um, don't, use, don't take this literally, because I think it's an old version, but we try and both risk stratify who needs to see whom, when, and for how long. So you can see, and that's something you can ask your doctor, who do I need to see and how long do I need to see them for? And it varies by treatment, by risk, um, and sometimes by who's available to see them. So, you know, at our place, we have a survivorship program that you can graduate to. If someone doesn't have the survivorship program, then they may graduate just back to the PCP with oncology care as needed. Um, we've also developed the guidelines in a template form in our electronic health record. So we try and create this guideline for each patient and then put it in our record and then we share it with other providers and the primary, as well as the patients um, themselves. And then it lives in the record for here's what you had, here's what we did about it to treat your cancer, and here's what you need to do moving forward with regard to those four big buckets, who you need to see, what you need to watch out for, what kind of tests you need to get, and what kinds of things are we gonna counsel you about or should you look for so that you can live well through and beyond cancer. Um, also at Dana Farber, we have different models of how we care for care patients. So we have a model where patients can see a survivorship provider in a what consultative model. And we do this both at the main campus as well as at our satellites. Um, and that's, we try and see every patient between six to 12 months after completion of early active therapy. We also take patients in transfer from our oncology um, trenches. We also have survivorship focused providers in our divisions. Um, who see patients, especially in the large groups like breast, lymphoma, and GI, because not every patient wants to go see somebody else. They might want to see the NP or PA or doctor who was seeing them for their cancer, but does that treatment summary and survivorship care plan, here's what you had, here's what we did about it, and here's what you need to do and follow up, kind of a nice visit, explaining all that, a roadmap, so to speak, and then you know, getting it to the patient, getting it to their other providers, and then setting them on that course where they would still follow up with the oncology team, but now have a, a plan, which is nice. And then we also have an intervention specific um, clinic that right now we have primarily for our allogeneic bone marrow, marrow transplant patients because they go through a very intensive uh, course of therapy, have many specific needs, and we do kind of a boutique one-stop shopping kind of visit for them uh, in follow-up so they can get what they need and continue to get the oncology care that they get um, and need in follow-up. And what we try to do is kind of hug the disease programs from survivorship and at the same time to work with our specialists, our primary care doctors, our external partners, we have a robust pediatric program, and then very much with our psychosocial providers and behavioral modification folks in the Zacom Center and complementary therapy. Um, and there's a lot of excellent uh, stuff available online right now from the Zacom Center, which is free. So feel free to take a look at that, Z-A-K-I-M, if you Google Dana Farber and Zacom Center. Uh, we have subspecialists who focus on cancer survivors. So we have cardio-oncology, onco-nephrology, onco-endocrinology, onco-fertility, nutrition and exercise and healthy living. That's again with the Zacom Center. We have a robust sexual health program. We even have a sleep counselor who people can see in consultation. And then in the last year or so, we started a tobacco cessation program, which I'm embarrassed to say we didn't have one prior to this, but we keep, we did research, but we have, are now uh, able to do that and also plug in people in with the quit line if that's a better uh, fit for them in Massachusetts. I promised that I'd get to the psychosocial as I'm sure anybody who's listening knows survivors often experience a roller coaster of emotions and we try and have very close coordination with our psychosocial providers, our educational colleagues and resources 
uh, you know, we can't give therapy to every survivor, just like you couldn't to every person on the planet. The numbers are so vast, but we try and help people to get plugged in with information and ways to find mental health providers or support groups in their community if it's not as good of a fit to come into the cancer center here. Uh, we also, as I alluded to, work very closely with our pediatric uh, survivorship clinic, the David B. Perini Jr. Quality of Life Clinic. Uh, which is uh, older than the adult clinic at Dana-Farber and has been doing a stupendous job. And we try and model a lot of our programs after them. Although we don't want more kids to get cancer. It's a small, you know, it's a, they get a very focused approach, whereas we can't do that for all the adults, but we try and take some of the good stuff and scale it up. So I'll stop there, but I just wanted to say thank you. And I hope someday we have the opportunity to have a Q&A. Thank you.